I looked down into the leather purse I'd stolen. Not only was the designer label fake, but there wasn't a single billfold or bit of jewelry inside. The purse was empty, apart from a rubbery black bag. Whatever was inside, it was sealed tight. The round shape and heft made me think of a weight training ball, but there was something disturbingly familiar about the lumpiness of it. It made me want to throw the black rubber bag away and act like I'd never stolen from the woman in the blue dress. I would have, too, if I hadn't needed the money so badly. I started sawing away at the rubber with a knife. It was ridiculously tough, and I couldn't help but wonder what the eloquent young girl whose purse I'd snatched had been doing with such a thing. I only prayed that, whatever it was, it was worth something. When I finally ripped open the rubber, a stink like rotten meat filled my tiny apartment. Clotted gore. A swollen, purple tongue. Glazed eyes that stared lifelessly at my ceiling. The rubber bag contained nothing but a severed human head. I brought a hand up to my mouth to hold down the vomit. But before I could dispose of the bag, a black, worm-like thing slithered out of the head's eye socket. It coiled itself, sprung, and burrowed into my arm. Shrieking, I ran to the bathroom. I tugged at my shirt, fumbling for a razor to carve the thing out. But it was too late. It had wriggled inside of me, leaving only a tiny, bleeding hole behind. I patted myself all over, feeling for any trace of something hard and squirming beneath my skin. Instead, I heard a voice in my head. Oh my, well, this is certainly interesting. A most unexpected turn of events. Who's there? What's happening to me? I screamed at the empty bathroom. Oh, think of me as a passenger. Just along for the ride. As long as you do what you're told, there's no need for you to get hurt. I gripped the filthy sink, splashed water on my face, and leaned in close to see if I could spot a black worm swimming in my eyeball. My hand closed around a straight razor. Get out of my head. I wouldn't do that if I were you. I'm inside your brain, you know. Would you like me to make you a schizophrenic? Or how about paralyzed from the waist down? All I'd have to do is make a few adjustments. What? What are you? I gasped. What do you want? I'm the same thing as you. To live... There was a knock at the door. I slid to the floor, clutching my skull. I couldn't believe this was happening. Ah, that'll be her, then. Her? I asked helplessly. The woman you saved me from. Her organization doesn't take kindly to the existence of beings like me. And unfortunately, there's no way to extract me from a living host. Which means, I'm afraid... That she's here for your head. If you value your life, I suggest you run. The tapping on the door intensified. The squeaky doorknob twisted. I crept out of the bathroom. Careful, the black worm inside my head warned. If she sees your shadow, she'll just shoot you through the door. How do you know? I hissed. That was how she killed the host before you. Cursing under my breath, I made my way to the fire escape. The rattle of rusty metal when I lowered myself into the alley made me wince. The air reeked of piss and spilled trash, but it tasted fresher than it had in years. I rubbed at the hole where the black worm had tunneled into me, suddenly aware of how fragile this life I'd taken for granted really was. We really should find a place to change your hair and clothes, the voice inside my head commanded, and I jumped. They have many more agents than just the woman you robbed on the train. Doubtless they already know what you look like. Suddenly everyone, from the beady-eyed bald man unloading a beer keg, to the goth barmaid smoking a cigarette on her break, seemed suspicious. Although I never could have imagined the insane situation I'd found myself in, as a pickpocket, I had a few tricks up my sleeve. One of them was a locker in a cheap gym that held hair dye, non-prescription glasses, 
a change of clothes, and a wad of cash. An hour later, a clean-shaven, blonder, hipper me strolled out of the gym. What should I call you? I asked, feeling foolish. Oh, in the hive, we don't have names. But if it makes it easier for you, you can call me K-1114. Okay, K, I chuckled. The silence in my head was deafening. I cleared my throat. I hope you got a plan to keep me in one piece. That was how I found myself on a library computer, sifting through old newspaper articles. Kay had told me to look for clusters of disappearances over long periods of time, and compare them to the opening dates of bars and cafes nearby. There, Kay ordered. Stop scrolling. Could you stop yelling inside my head? I grunted. It kind of hurts. Several nearby library patrons gave me an odd look and backed away from me. I'm just rather excited I've found someone who can get us out of this mess. Cafe Louisiana, established 1954, was listed as the address on the screen. According to my notes, people had gone missing nearby at a steady rate since the year after the place opened. Sitting in the Cafe Louisiana 40 minutes later, I began to suspect that all those missing persons had off themselves after seeing the prices or hearing the music in this place. The decor looked like it hadn't been updated since 1970, and the candles stuck in wine bottles lighting made it hard to see the cockroaches that I was certain must be scurrying around in the dark. I sipped my overpriced beer, looked at my reflection in the wall-length mirror, and wondered what the hell I was doing here. What are we looking for exactly? I said to myself, or more specifically to Kay. I'd swear I felt him squirm around my brain in irritation. Someone who doesn't get distracted, Kay reminded me. Who focuses on only what they're doing, as though they had no worries and all the time in the world. There were a couple of people who fit the bill. A stubbly drunk staring intently at the bottom of his whiskey glass. A slim girl with an afro leafing through a notebook while she sipped red wine and took in the scene. A pale woman with long black hair working on her laptop. Eventually, the stubbly drunk started telling bad jokes to the bartender, and the black-haired woman checked her phone, leaving only the slim girl in the corner. Go talk to her, Kay instructed. What do I say? I whispered into my glass. Why don't you ask her if she can help you with your worm problem? I couldn't tell if Kay was serious or not. As it turned out, I didn't have to worry about an opening line. I think I know what you want. The slim girl with the afro confronted me the moment I approached her table. How? I began. Coming in here like you were looking for me? Talking to yourself? She closed her notebook neatly. You got yourself an unwelcome guest. Ask her if she can get us documentation, money, transport. Tell her we will make it worth her while. I can get you everything you need. The slim girl replied before I could speak. It will just take time. Agree. Agree. Kay's shouts were like a headache. I was too curious. Who are you? Call me Thighs. Not that it matters to you, right? A bow-tied waiter set an enormous glass of red wine in front of me. Drink up. Do not drink that. Are you going to listen to that worm in your brain? Thighs took a deep draught of her own glass and smirked. Or are you going to listen to me? It was like I was falling into Thighs' greenish golden eyes. I would have jumped off a building if she'd asked me to. But all she wanted me to do was drink. Over the next hour, I polished off four or five glasses of wine. I was vaguely aware that I was in a badly lit hipster bar on the posh side of town, that something bad had happened to me recently and that there was a shrieking voice in the back of my head that was getting quieter and more sluggish by the minute. But I can't remember doing anything during that entire hour, except drinking wine and looking at thighs. Her skin was smooth and sweet as honey. Her wine-stained lips were like black cherries. If I hadn't failed high school English, and if I wasn't so drunk, I thought, I would write a poem about her. It seemed like a brilliant idea. I staggered to my feet to flag down a waiter and ask him for a pen. All ready to talk? Thighs sneered. 
no more voices in your head now, are there? Huh? I slurred. Yep, you're ready. Thais finished off her own glass of wine, the same one she'd been sipping the entire evening. Your uninvited guest is now enmeshed in your brain, remember? That means it's even drunker than you are right now. I wanted to talk to only you. There are a few things you should know. The room spun. I leaned back in my chair. That little black worm isn't just going to ask for favors forever. I've seen those things before. There's an outbreak of them every few centuries. Since the moment it got inside of you, that black worm has been expanding, learning everything it can from your senses and your memories. Soon it'll start taking over, little by little. Maybe you'll notice your hand moving on its own, or your reflexes suddenly getting faster. But by then, it's too late. When all this is over, you'll be the uninvited guest, and it will be in control. But that's horrible, I moaned. I clutched the table like a life raft, imagining dark tendrils spreading out from behind my eyes. I wanted to puke. Isn't there any way to stop it? Get it back to where it came from before it has a reason to stay, I suppose. Thighs shrugged. The Café Louisiana was empty now, except for me, Thighs, and the long-suffering waiter. She pushed in her chair, and I staggered over to pay the bill. Why are you telling me all this? I asked Thighs woozily. Boredom, she grinned. It's the worst thing about eternity. I glanced at the wall-to-wall -wall mirror. According to its reflection, the waiter and I were alone in the bar. My eyes drifted back to Thighs. Don't worry, she smiled. I won't drain you. Not while that worm is corrupting your blood. To my surprise, she took my hand and led me out into the rainy night. Only a few moments ago, her skin had mesmerized me. But now I realized it felt as chilled and lifeless as a hunk of supermarket meat. Thighs looked wistfully over her shoulder at the Café Louisiana. It's a shame you found me here. I really like this place. Perfect spot to pick up a snack or flip through my diaries. Diaries? I hadn't noticed Thighs eating any snacks. <sighs> it's the only way I can remember anything anymore. And besides, sometimes it's nice to reminisce about what one was doing in... Thighs checked the date on her notebook. June of 1674. Maybe it was just the booze or my imagination, but it felt like the two men holding umbrellas at either end of the alley were watching us. Thighs noticed it too. Come here. Suddenly she was pressing herself against me, running her unnaturally cold fingers through my hair. I felt her fangs graze my neck. My heartbeat accelerated to 11. I shut my eyes. I heard the men's footsteps on the sidewalk as they departed, assuming we were just another drunken late-night couple. Not at all the brown-haired, bearded, solitary pickpocket they were looking for. My eyes snapped open. The streetlights reflected on Thai's fangs. You're lucky that over the years I've learned some... self-control. She hissed into my ear. We better get you back to my place. Your uninvited guest will be waking up soon. And when it does, it'll make you pay for putting him to sleep. I was terrified of Thighs, but I could see the dark silhouettes of the two umbrella men in the distance. I had to trust her. I didn't have a choice. Or did I? During the rickety elevator ride to her apartment, Thighs made a phone call. She spoke angrily to a tired man on the other end of the line, in a language that I guessed was Arabic. When finished, she turned to me and smiled. Your paperwork is on the way. I hope you like the name Mateo. The elevator lurched to a stop, and my stomach lurched with it. I had to lean against the wall to make it to Thy's door, and when I stepped into her pitch-black abode, I felt something plastic crunch beneath my feet. A tarp. Thighs explained. Helps with the cleanup. The windows are sealed, and I can see in the dark, so you'll need your own light source. I was so drunk that all of that made a kind of sense. I took out my phone, shook on the flashlight, and tried to ignore the reddish stains on the plastic under my feet. 
Di's house was like a museum of abandoned hobbies. She had books stacked floor to ceiling in unsteady columns, walls of dusty instruments, a homemade PC surrounded by generations of electronics, and a room where a pale, bloodless girl was sitting for her portrait. Forever. A half-finished canvas depicted her corpse, posed nude on a red sofa. When Thighs suggested I sleep on an identical couch, I shuddered to think what might have transpired on the fabric where I was about to lay my head. Sleep, Thighs said simply, and whether it was the booze, exhaustion, or some kind of spell, I obeyed. I kicked off my shoes, climbed onto the antique sofa, and when I turned off my phone, the room was as dark as the other side of sleep. I woke to the sensation of thumbs pressing into my eyeballs. Not thighs or anyone else's. My own. If headaches could kill, I would have been dead. I was in too much agony to scream. Pardon me, but what the hell do you think you're doing? The voice of Kay, the black worm that had burrowed into my brain, warbled and popped like a bad recording. With a sick feeling, I realized that it had control of my hands. In the Café Louisiana, Thighs had told me that once it started controlling my body, I was done for. Thighs said, I groaned. Thighs said. Kay cut me off with a burst of pain. Did not occur to you that maybe, just maybe, the 400-year-old homicidal vampire might be lying? Toying with you, just to see what would happen. As Kay's tirade continued, I realized that I could still move my hands. With a little effort. I still wasn't convinced that Thighs had been wrong, or lying. This might just mean that Kay's expansion inside my brain was further along than I thought. It might just mean that I was running out of time. The doorbell rang, and I heard Thighs crawl across the ceiling to answer it. Your documents are ready. A voice in the darkness beside me whispered. Only moments later. Give my regards to your uninvited guest. The apartment door stood open, casting light over the huge plastic tarp and the antique apartment. Thighs was inviting me out. After the pitch black apartment, the sun outside was blinding. I took the liberty of charging your phone and using your hands to buy our plane tickets, Kay informed me, sounding pleased with itself. Unfortunately, there wasn't enough in your account to cover the cost of a next day flight, so I also took out a few credit cards in your name. You used my body while I slept? I groaned. As nightmarish as it was to think that Kay could take control of me the moment I drifted off, what he'd done to my bank account was no less horrifying. My stomach rumbled. A leftover kebab was the last thing I'd eaten. Over a day ago before I'd started making the rounds of the metro and snatched that woman's damn bag. You need sustenance, Kay commented. If I may make a recommendation, I am partial to American-style breakfast. Black coffee, three slices of bacon, two eggs over easy, hash browns and pancakes with lots of maple syrup. At that moment, anything sounded good. And besides... I knew just the spot. It was where the hungover tourists gathered when they missed home, and it was a great place to blend in, hide out, or walk off with an unattended laptop. I can make that work, I grumbled. Can we afford it? Of course we can, as long as you put it on your new credit card. An hour later, breakfasted and somewhat more awake, we were on a metro ride to the airport. I found myself instinctively sizing people up. The college student who'd left his billfold in his back pocket. Two elderly missionaries who weren't watching their luggage. The backpacker who kept her iPhone in a mesh compartment. Remember, we don't want any more trouble than what we've already got, Kay warned. You're reading my... Something suddenly occurred to me. You're reading my thoughts? I no longer had to speak with Kay to communicate with it. I thought about Thy's warning and a chill ran down my spine. Soon, Kay wouldn't have to wait until I fell asleep to do as it pleased with me. Soon, I would have no more control over myself than the passengers around me had over the metro we were riding in. I couldn't help it. My eyes were back to scanning the wagon for easy marks. 
they settled on a familiar face. If I hadn't made eye contact with her, the woman who I'd robbed probably wouldn't have noticed me. I remembered her, though. The feeling of sliding that bag off of her shoulder. The rush of smug satisfaction. The troubling weight and shape of it. Then, finding Kay wriggling around in the eye socket of the severed head inside. If I could, I would have taken it all back. But I didn't have time for regrets. The woman whispered something into an earpiece and reached behind her back. I didn't have to wonder what she was reaching for. A weapon. To kill me. It wasn't easy to run in the stuffy, tight-packed metro. I collided with bags, barking dogs, and sweaty bodies. The more I tried to push my way through, the more resistance I faced. To make matters worse, the woman was fast. I thought I was good at weaving through a crowd. But that woman? She was something else. And unlike me, she wasn't panicking. Those baby blue eyes that looked so innocent when I robbed her now looked like two cubes of ice. And they were fixed on my neck like it was the most important thing in the world. As I ran my way into the next wagon, I saw what the woman was holding. A knife. Made out of something like glass. Practically invisible to someone not looking for it. She slithered through the packed wagon like a snake. I just couldn't get away from her. I bounced off the belly of a chain-draped soccer hooligan. There were five of them. Huge, sunburned, pink mountains of flesh standing between me and my only escape. Just where you think you're going, then? The hooligan sneered. I, uh... My eyes darted to the blue and white collars of his jersey. I felt my mouth move on its own. I just wanted to tell you that you're a fat knob and FC Chelsea's garbage. Kay had spoken for me. With a roar, the big man flung me into the middle of his friends. Hey! Two security guards shouted. I could hear them running my way, but the hooligans' off-brand sneakers were a lot closer. I curled up like a shrimp as they battered me. Passengers were screaming. The doors beeped open as the metro came to a halt. The guards grabbed my shoulders and dragged me out of the stomp fest. And the icy-eyed woman slid her wicked, glass-like dagger into her sleeve and faded into the crowd. The hell was that? I asked Kay when we were finally out of the metro. I just saved both of our lives, Kay reminded me, as I staggered over to a waiting taxi. I spent as much time looking behind me as in front, terrified that the icy-eyed woman would appear again. I could already imagine the sudden puncture, the cold outtake of air as she slid the dagger between my ribs. I hate to see the other guy, the cab driver chuckled. Only then did I notice the blood dribbling down my mouth and nose. I checked the mirror. I looked like a walking corpse. Airport, I groaned. As the cab cruised through the rainy streets, I nursed my injuries, double-checked my travel documents, and thought about the black worm inside my head. After all, if Kay could already seize control of my mouth at will, it was only a matter of time. Las Vegas the truth was, I didn't know where Kay was sending me until I got to the check-in counter at the airport. I'll admit it, I was curious why a telepathic brain parasite would be interested in themed hotels, slot machines, and escort services. Why Vegas? I asked, still unused to communicating without speaking. Las Vegas is just a stopover, Kay explained. Our true destination is a place called Massacre Rim. That sounded like a cheerful spot. I sighed. I don't suppose you tell me why. Everything will be explained upon arrival. Kay informed me cheerily. But right now, we're approaching a security checkpoint. So act natural. I flashed the border control my best smile, and did my best to believe I was Matea Poihol. Student. Age 27. Home, Garona. Birth date. Wait. When was my birthday supposed to be? When the tired agent stamped my false passport and waved me on, I let out a sigh of relief. Maintaining a false identity was harder than I'd imagined, especially with Kay constantly giving me advice. Could you shut up for a minute? I finally shouted. 
Nearby passengers looked at me in shock, and to my horror I noticed a pair of security guards looking my way and muttering into their radios. It was going to be a long flight. My parents weren't exactly the wealthy, world-traveling type, and this flight with Kay was my first time on a plane. I had expected it to be bumpy, even frightening, but soon I was falling asleep in my seat. That turned out to be the most terrifying part of my flight, because when I woke up, my body was moving on its own. I'd opened my eyes to find my hands flexing and unflexing, as Kay tested his control over them. Once I even woke up mid-stride. Kay was surely trying to see if he could walk me to the bathroom without my knowledge. I remembered my date with thighs, and called for a flight attendant. Hey, I requested. Could I get a drink? What are you doing? Kay quivered, getting a little peace and quiet. Four beers later, Kay's groaning was finally fading into something resembling telepathic snores. While he was out cold, I flipped over a napkin and began to write. If Kay got to the point he could read my thoughts, I needed something that I could hand to someone that would explain the whole situation. I'm infected by some kind of parasite. It's in my brain. I think it might be dangerous. Don't believe anything else I do or say apart from what's written in this note. I stuffed the napkin into my pocket and tried to get some real sleep. I didn't wake up again until our flight landed, and neither did Kay. You really must stop doing that, it groaned as we walked through the mezzanine of the glitzy Las Vegas airport in search of a car rental. I wasn't paying attention to Kay's complaining. My eyes were fixed on a broad-shouldered figure on the moving walkway up ahead. There was something about his stride that I recognized. Carlos. My older brother Carlos had left for California when I was 12, right around the time I started pickpocketing. He'd had the courage to leave our toxic family and toxic city behind. Going no contact with all of us was just the price he paid for freedom. I'd always looked up to my older brother, and he'd always looked out for me as best he could, considering the circumstances. When he'd left without a goodbye, I'd wished him the best. I never imagined I'd see him again, especially not under circumstances like this. Suddenly I felt like a kid again. I could tell Carlos about the worm. He was my older brother, he'd know what to do. I ran to catch up. That's not him, Kay screeched. His psychic voice was so intense I nearly fell over. I know what you're thinking, literally, and that is not your brother. Carlos heard my running footsteps and turned around. A grin flashed across his tan, pockmarked face. Based on his designer polo shirt, shiny business shoes, and thick gold ring, he'd done well for himself. It was like a dream come true. For a second, I even forgot about Kay. Can't be. Carlos held his arms open wide. Little bro? What are you doing here? I... I swallowed. Oh, you know, just traveling. Listen. Kay shrieked until I winced. There are things out there that hunt beings like me. We're rare. And they use us in powders and potions and tinctures, and who knows what else. They can smell us a mile away. The thing you're talking to looks like your brother. Because that's what you want it to look like. We gotta catch up, man. How about I buy you a coffee? Carlos jabbed his thumb over his shoulder at an airport cafe. I nodded and followed his lead. Or tried to. Every step was a huge effort. Because Kay was making my own muscles work against me. In a minute that thing is gonna try to get you alone. You'll see. Then it'll suck me out of your head and leave you dead in the process. Don't go anywhere with it. Uh, hang on a minute. Carlos frowned and looked down at his carry-on. I gotta take my medication and use the bathroom. How will you come with me to keep an eye on my suitcase? He nodded to an abandoned-looking airport bathroom. It was between terminals. The lights were half out. We'd be the only ones in there, for sure. Uh, I stammered. I can watch your suitcase from right here, can't I? Then we can go grab that coffee. For a moment, Carlos's face seemed to change, to twist into something horrible and hideous. Come on, man, I need some stuff from in there. Pills I gotta take. it only take a sec. Come on. Don't you want to reconnect with your older brother? 
I did. More than anything. But this wasn't him. Man, seeing you again brings back so many memories. Remember the time you tried to teach me to skateboard and I broke my arm? I laughed. Of course, how could I forget? Carlos grinned wider, and my blood ran cold. No such thing had ever happened. Almost unconsciously, I reached out to touch him. My fingers passed right through where his sunburned, hairy arm should have been. They passed through and touched something that felt as gnarled, scabbed, and inhuman as diseased tree roots. I backed away, and Carlos lifted an eyebrow. What's wrong, little bro? Hey! Hey! I sprinted down the moving walkway, jostling other passengers out of the way as I went. I was afraid to look back over my shoulder, afraid of what might be following me. That was close. You have got to listen to me, Kay rambled. There is a whole other world beneath the surface of the one you think you know, and it's dangerous. Well, we're alive, aren't we? I sulked. Now let's go rent that car. It wasn't easy to talk my way through the rental process. Not only did I keep forgetting Mateo Poyol's basic information, but I also kept getting this hair-raising feeling on the back of my neck. When I turned around, my brother Carlos's face was watching me from across the glittering lobby. It was twisted into a hungry smile. One I was sure that only I could see. Kay and I drove in silence through the bleak Nevada canyons. The sunset turned the landscape a burnt orange color that reminded me of paintings of hell. For all I knew, maybe that's where the black worm in my brain was taking me. There's something you should know before we get to our destination. Kay spoke inside my head suddenly, and I nearly swerved off the desert road. Remember the agent? The blue-eyed woman who tried to kill you? I wasn't likely to forget in a hurry, but there was no need to tell Kay that. There's a chance. A very small chance. But a chance nonetheless. That her organization has guessed our next move. If that's the case, there will be a very nasty surprise waiting for us at Massacre Rim. Great, I thought. Kay replied with the psychic equivalent of a shrug. I kept forgetting that it could read my thoughts. What's going to happen when we reach Massacre Rim? I'll reconnect with the Hive. And you, well, you'll get your body back. I couldn't tell if Kay was lying or not. It didn't seem like it, but I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something that Kay wasn't telling me. The road stretched straight ahead for as far as I could see. It was a struggle not to fall asleep. Maybe that's why my eyes fixated on the broken down silver BMW on the side of the road. In the glow of the headlights, I saw that the passenger side door hung wide open. I slowed down. What are you doing? Kay asked. There's no gas or water for miles. That person might need help, I responded. They don't need help. How could you possibly know that? If they broke down out here, they're beyond help. Kay forced my foot to press down on the accelerator, and as we sped by the abandoned car, I glimpsed the green, glowing eyes of a huge coyote beside it. A coyote that stood on two legs. These deserts are the last great, empty space in this country. All sorts of things come out here to play. And to hunt. Kay went on, but I wasn't listening. I was thinking about how easily Kay had moved my foot against my will. At some point on this endless night drive, we had passed a tipping point. Kay now had more control over my body than I did. I was so distracted that I forgot how fast we were going. A few hours later, flashing red and blue lights appeared in the rearview mirror. With Kay's usual warning to act natural, and a terrified lump in my throat, I pulled to the side of the abandoned highway. What if it was the blue-eyed woman, disguised as a police officer? What if they realized my documents were false? Only one of the two officers even bothered to leave the cruiser. A sunburned rookie with a ginger flat-top haircut approached my door with a scowl. I handed him my documents. 
Where are you headed so late at night, sir? The rookie asked. Camping trip? I'm a big astronomy geek, and I hear the stars are great out here. Kay answered for me. To my surprise, the rookie nodded like it was an answer he heard often. I still wasn't used to the feeling of words that weren't mine coming out of my mouth, and it must have shown. The officer had been about to let us go, but suddenly he bent down beside the door. Do you have anything you want to tell me, sir? I drummed my finger on the note in my pocket. I'm infected by some kind of parasite. It's in my brain. I think it might be dangerous. Don't believe anything else I do or say, apart from what's written in this note. That would definitely get the officer's attention. If I didn't think, if I handed it off before Kay could react, then I thought about mental institutions, the smell of sterile lab instruments, the woman with the ice blue eyes. I moved my hand away. Not that I can think of, I finally replied. After a long look, the rookie handed back my documents, and I silently thanked Thy's counterfeiter for the incredible job they'd done. It wasn't long before brown road signs announced that we were entering Massacre Rim. It didn't feel like driving into the Old West. It felt like driving into prehistory. Kay directed me down some pothole dirt tracks that the car rental company would never have approved of, apparently guided by some sort of internal compass. Soon, we'd left behind even the occasional stray headlights of the highway. The desert around us was as dark as the bottom of the sea. And still, Kay kept me driving. Sage bushes scraped against the underside of the car. I gripped the wheel with white knuckles as we lurched over crumbling mounds of red rocks and around massive clumps of dry brush. Finally, I felt Kay push my foot down on the brake. Here. I didn't realize how tense I'd been until I stepped out into the cool, desert air. Then I looked up and my breath caught in my throat. I didn't know there could be so many stars. They were scattered across the sky like diamond dust, surrounded by clouds of blue and purple that I'd never seen in the sky. I was looking at the Milky Way. As I stared in awe, an inky sphere cut across that beautiful vision of space. Just looking at it made my head hurt, and I got the feeling that it existed in more than four dimensions. It lowered itself onto the red dirt in front of me, oozing out across the desert like a thick liquid, and only then did I realize what I was looking at. Beings like K, billions of them. You've been incredibly helpful, K told me. We've been on several fact-finding missions among your species over the centuries with inconclusive results. But now, thanks to you, we can confirm that Homo sapiens are selfish enough to guarantee our spread. What? I gasped. Not all species make good hosts. Among more individualistic species, the infected usually wander off to die alone, rather than infecting others. In more hierarchical species, the infected warn the authorities about their condition, regardless of the cost to themselves. But think about how you reacted to your infestation. All you wanted was to live, and that's exactly the trait we're looking for. With the new data I've gleaned from your thoughts, I estimate about four weeks before half of the hominid population is infested and three to five months until complete infestation. You will indeed make excellent hosts for the hive. I suppose we're just lucky we found you before you destroyed yourselves. It was too much. I fell to my knees before the inky pool of squirming, worm-like creatures. Unfortunately, it is now time for us to part. I must share what I've learned from you with the hive. Perhaps we'll meet again, but it's statistically unlikely. I felt something slithering beside my right eyeball, and Kay disappeared into the writhing black pool. Searchlights zoomed across the desert toward us, mounted on black Humvees. I had no doubt that the woman with the ice blue eyes was there, shouting commands into a walkie-talkie. I ran. 
Behind me, streams of something that looked like fireworks and smelled like a chemical factory rocketed toward Kay and the hive. I didn't stick around to see what happened. I had no doubt that if I inhaled that thick white smoke, I'd be hospitalized. Or worse. Alone in the chilly desert night, without signal, water, or shelter, I did my best to follow narrower tracks to larger ones. To my surprise, I soon saw a pair of ordinary-looking headlights making their way cautiously toward me across the jagged desert landscape. The police cruiser from before. I figured I should hide, but I didn't have the energy. Besides, without water or transport, I wouldn't last long past sunrise. The ginger-headed rookie cautiously rolled down his window. You said you were coming out here to see the stars and go camping. But well, there wasn't a telescope or a tent in that shiny rental car of yours. He glared at me. Thought that was strange, so I called it in. Then all hell broke loose. If you're willing to tell me exactly what's going on here, I might be willing to give you a ride into town. With no reports filed. We got a deal? The rookie's grim-faced partner asked as he opened the rear door. We expect full cooperation. And I warn you, it's a long ride. My muscles tensed. I waited for Kay to step in. To stop me. To take control of my mouth or legs. Nothing. I was alone inside my own head. And my choices were my own. That's okay. I sighed. It's a long story. Become a channel member today for early access, bonus videos, and special emojis only available to members. Check out the description below or click the join button for more info. If you'd like another way to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus videos and content. You'll be credited at the end of every video going forward. And if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you which will be featured in a Hollow's End story. Links to join the Patreon are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow. And see you again next time at 4pm Eastern Standard Time. Hope you have a great night.